Well, good morning, church. And I'd like to say, first off, it's good to be a bald brother. I, I love that. I, I, claim, I claim that um, identity this morning. Thank you, uh, Brandon. And um, thank you, Brandon, for a, a long friendship. I, I said in an earlier service, uh, I'm grateful for, for our long uh, friendship, but uh, particularly uh, we were at a, a youth ministry conference years ago at, at Princeton. And uh, Brandon, I know you don't know this about Brandon, but he likes to have a good time, even in the midst of, of the work and the learning, and wanted to go into New York City. And this boy had never been into New York City before. And Brandon said, why don't you come along with me? And we actually uh, got to sit behind home plate uh, at a New York Yankees game, which was uh, pretty pretty awesome. We weren't close up, weren't the real expensive seats, but we were, we were still behind home plate. But um, just have a lot of fond memories um, over the year. Um, and I also want to say thank you, uh, Randy, Harry, and thank you, Providence Church, uh, for inviting me to be here this morning. What a pleasure. Well, I bring you greetings from Roof Above CEO, Liz Clayson Kelly. And I want to also offer a monster truck size thank you for all the ways that you have supported Roof Above over the years. I mean, I'm going to leave something out. I know that already. Room in the Inn, Operation Sandwich, faithfully serving meals in our shelters month in and month out. Clothing, hygiene product, drives, major gifts, major gifts that in, have enabled shelters that are opening this night to exist because of your major gifts. Um, I can't, you know, the, the uh, where do we where do we stop? Where do we stop? Not to mention Brandon, who is also a gift to Roof Above um, and has been a volunteer mainstay with us for, gosh, one, easily a year, easily a year. So it's always great to see as Brandon is really uh, deeply embedded in our work and really grateful for that. Well, uh, just a little about me that some of you may not know. I came to Roof Above quite by accident. Roof Above, by the way, I know it's a branding challenge here. Roof Above is, uh, was the, is the product of a merger between uh, the Men's Shelter of Charlotte and the Urban Ministry Center. We came together in 2019 and formed Roof Above, and our mission is to end homelessness one life at a time. Well, I came to Roof Above quite by accident. Ten years ago, I was looking for a side gig to augment my daytime work. Saw a job posting uh, about a part-time shelter specialist at Men's Shelter of Charlotte. We were then Men's Shelter of Charlotte. I needed the extra money, but I don't know. wasn't sure it was the right job for me. And so I called up a close friend and Providence member, who many of you know, Jim Wallen, and asked his opinion. Still had a lot of questions about what I was getting myself into, but I knew I could count on Jim's advice. And Jim said, why not? What do you have to lose? I mean, I needed the money. Well, thanks to Jim's vicarious bravery, that is Jim being brave for me when I wasn't being very brave for myself, I applied, interviewed, and I got the job. And 10 years later, I'm still doing some of the most gratifying work of my life. Isn't it a blessing to have an angel in your life like Jim Wallen? You can think of those angels in your life this day. So we come to our scripture reading this morning, Matthew 25, 31 through 45. It's one of the most iconic, recognized passages in all of Scripture. To, truly, I tell you, just as you did it for one of the least of my brothers and sisters of mine, you did it to me. Matthew 25, 31 through 46. It's Jesus' very last message before the dramatic events of his final week on earth. Beginning with, uh, let's go back a little bit, beginning with the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 5 through 7, that concludes this way, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Jesus' teaching ministry builds to a climax in this parable. No way to underestimate its significance. And the message is clear. 
how we treat the most vulnerable, how we treat the people who've been knocked down, who've fallen so many times they've decided they just don't want to get up again, how we put our faith into loving action. That's, that's how our lives will be judged. Interestingly, nothing in the parable about accepting Jesus as our Lord and Savior, nothing about being born again, nothing about salvation by grace through faith. Nothing. William Barclay, the great Bible scholar of the last century, says this about this text. He says, this is one of the most vivid parables Jesus ever spoke. And the lesson is crystal clear that God will judge us in accordance with our reaction to human need. Judgment does not depend on the knowledge we've amassed, the fame we've acquired, the fortune that we have gained, but on the help we've given. God will judge us in accordance with our reaction to human need. When we had an opportunity to help someone in need, we did it. Well, this parable can land on our ears with a disheartening thud. I can hear the theme from the music Jaws, uh, from the movie Jaws playing menacingly in the background, can't you? But that's where our bishop, Ken Carter, comes to the rescue this morning. At least he came to the rescue for me. He says this about this parable. He says, Matthew 25 is not a passage of scripture that's intended to heap guilt upon us. Did you hear that, church? This is a passage of scripture that's not intended to heap guilt upon us. He goes on, it's an invitation. It's right there in the parable. Jesus says, come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. I think Bishop Carter, Ken's, we know him as Ken. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll dispense with the bishop part. Ken's suggestion is so helpful here to think of Matthew 25, 31 through 45 as an invitation, not an indictment, not a guilt trip, not a courtroom, but a calling, an invitation. It's an invitation that one of my heroes, Brian Stevenson, founder of the Equal Justice Initiative, calls, it's an invitation to what he calls a life of miraculous, redemptive excitement. Say it back to me, church. Miraculous, redemptive excitement. That was good. You, you actually a step up from the earlier services. <laughs> Miraculous, redemptive excitement. Now listen to how Brian Stevenson, this is a rather long quote, it's so important, how he explains this miraculous, redemptive excitement. One thing is that a, a lot of us really deprive ourselves of opportunities for incomparable joy and extraordinary spiritual affirmation and meaning when we shield ourselves from engaging people who are in crisis, suffering, sick, in prison. He goes on, what I'd like to communicate to everyone is, is that if you get proximate to death row prisoners, to people who are struggling, and you just bear witness to their struggle and assist them when you can, there is this extraordinary redemptive experience that will reach you. Don't go into thinking that you're doing this for somebody else. Understand that you're doing this for yourself because I guarantee you'll get more from it than you'll give. And then he concludes this way. I think that when we shield ourselves from these sorts of experiences, we deny ourselves a lot of miraculous, redemptive excitement that being a person of faith can offer us. Marvelous invitation in this parable, an invitation to discover an incomparable joy that's only, only found in putting our faith into loving action in living our mercy. Mitch Album heard this invitation to a life of miraculous, redemptive excitement. Mitch Album, you know who that is wrote the best-selling memoir, Tuesdays with Maury. Uh, I'm an a avid book reader, and he just released a new book, I think, this past Tuesday. But Tuesdays with Maury was kind of his uh, kind of official coming out party to the world, um, a gift to us. It's been, it's been 25 years since Tuesday with Maury was first published. Well, 
For those of you who may not know the story uh, behind the book, Maury Schwartz was a beloved college professor of Mitch Album at Brandeis University. Album went on to become, uh, made a name for himself as a sports writer. Let Brandeis Album took all of Schwartz's sociology class, but Schwartz was so much more than a beloved professor. He was like an, an uncle to, to Album. Well, at his graduation, Schwartz made Album promise that he would stay in touch, but, but Album got busy with life and career. You know how that goes. Well, 16 years later, 16 years later, Album just, just happened to be walking by a TV late one night, and he saw his old college professor, Maury Schwartz, on an episode of Nightline with Ted Koppel. Nightline with Ted Koppel ran for 25 years. Last episode was in 2005. Well, Schwartz had been diagnosed with ALS. And in the spring of 1995, Ted Koppel was talking with Schwartz about living with this very dreaded disease and facing his death. Well, Album seeing the TV, was shocked to see his beloved mentor there. And he got in touch with him the very next day and immediately arranged to come visit him. It happened to be on what day? Tuesday. Tuesday. And before he left that first Tuesday, Schwartz made Album promise to come back. And this time Album did. Came back the next Tuesday and the next Tuesday and the next Tuesday until Maury's death just months later in November of 1995. Tuesdays with Maury. Well, one Tuesday they were having one of their discussions and, and Maury asked Mitch, Mitch, what do you do for charity? I mean, what do you do for people around you that don't have as much as you do? What do you do for your community? Album replied, I write checks. And Maury said to him, anybody can write checks. What do you do for your community? Album never forgot that question or that conversation. It proved to be a turning point in his life. Mitch Album, it turns out, had a Jim Wallen in his life too. That, that conversation really launched all the charitable things that, that Album does to this day. Started his first charity that year, and, and uh, to my understanding, he operates nine charities in Detroit to this day and also, and probably is more well known for this, operates a, a, an orphanage in Haiti where he travels to as often as possible, finds his deepest satisfaction there. The invitation. It's there for us in Matthew 25, an, an invitation to a life of miraculous, redemptive excitement. Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. I was talking with Linda Phillips, another Providence member here this morning, and, and, and we both mentioned together, uh, we, might, we might also add, and I think this would be added with God's blessing, I was struggling with mental illness, and you came alongside me. Matthew 25, it's an, an invitation to get proximate, to get close up to suffering, to come alongside those who are struggling. What did Maury Schwartz say to Mitch Album? Anybody can write checks. Now, before I go any further, let me say this about writing checks. Roof Above couldn't open their doors tomorrow if there weren't incredibly, incredibly generous people. So don't, don't get me wrong there. I'm a member of the philanthropy team and I would be fired tomorrow if I, if I said anything differently. But I believe it. It's so important that we have those generous people in our lives and in our community that make it possible for us to open our doors. But the parable is an invitation to do more than that, just writing the checks. Author and activist Shane Claiborne tells about the time he did a little survey. He asked participants who claimed to be strong followers of Jesus whether Jesus spent time with the poor. And nearly 80% said yes. I find that percentage a little low, actually, if you were reading the Gospels. It seemed like it would have been higher, but 80% said, agreed, yes, Jesus spent time with the poor. 
But later in the survey, uh, Claiborne uh, sneaks in another question, and he asks this same group of strong followers whether they spent, spent, whether they spent time with the poor, and according to, to Claiborne, less than 2% said they did. Claiborne writes this, the great tragedy of the church is not that rich Christians do not care about the poor, but that rich Christians do not know the poor. And I would say in this parable, we're invited to make that journey from caring about the least of these to knowing the least of these. Where am I going with this church? If we, if we really believe it's Jesus who we are meeting in the hungry, the thirsty, the homeless, the shivering, the sick, the prisoner, then, then, then something more is asked of us in this parable, is it not? We're not just called to give to good causes, to volunteer, to be considerate and caring, but to be in real community, real kinship, real relationship, with those who are overlooked and ignored. As my friend Kevin Nye suggests, if we truly believe that the ones we've been, who've been kicked to the gutter in our world are Jesus in his most distressing disguise, then, then taking our turn at room in the inn or reaching into our pocket for some change, listen to this, would be considered the very floor of our calling, not the ceiling. Did you hear me? would be considered the very floor of our calling, not the ceiling. Real community, real kinship, real relationship. That's our calling. It's it's about being, it's about making that commitment to be family to one in need, to one another forever. Jesus' parable, in Jesus' discourse in the Gospel of John, Farewell discourse in the Gospel of John. Let me get it right. He promises us this. This is, I think it's John 17. He promises us, I will not leave you as orphans. And in that sacred vow to us, we find our own sacred calling to others. No one gets left behind. No one. As Father Greg Boyle puts it, a a decision gets made to live in each other's hearts. A decision gets made to live in each other's hearts. In my first appointment as an associate pastor at Central United Methodist Church in Monroe, that was 1983, whew, 40 years ago. Disappointed to be using those numbers this morning. Or maybe I should be grateful I'm using those numbers this morning because that means I'm still kicking, but it was 40 years ago. And I lived in the Associates Parsonage on Elizabeth Avenue. One day I was out cutting the grass when two kids walked by. They were jawing at each other, looked like they were ready to scrap. So I cut off my lawnmower and informed them there would be no fighting on my watch. So I had them separate, one on one side of the street, one on my side of the street. Struck up a conversation with the young man on my side of the street, learned his name, and also learned that he was living in a foster care group home not far from that parsonage. Didn't know anything about it. Interestingly enough, though, I had recently applied to be a a big buddy with the Union County uh, Department of Social Services, but hadn't been assigned a little buddy yet. I mentioned it to the social worker that I'd met a young man living in a group home nearby, totally random coincidence, and that, that maybe I could be his big buddy if he was in the market for a big buddy. Seemed like maybe it wasn't coincidence at all that that God had put us in the same place at the same time for some reason. Forty years later, my little buddy is in his 50s. We keep in touch by phone. Always try to connect when he's in town with his wife and son. Forty years later, he's family to me. I'm family to him. A decision gets made to live in each other's hearts. All that is is just a miraculous, redemptive excitement at work, something I certainly never saw calling. Thank you, God. Well, to finish up, I'm a big fan of jazz singer-songwriter Gregory Porter's music. His song, Take Me to the Alley, beautifully captures the message of Matthew 25, sums up everything this morning, I think. Listen to the words. 
Well, they gild their houses in preparation for the king, and they line the sidewalks with every sort of shiny thing. They will be surprised when they hear him say, Take me to the alley. Take me to the afflicted ones. Take me to the lonely ones that somehow lost their way. Let them hear me say, I am your friend. That's our calling, church. That's our calling, church. Take me to the alley. Take me to the afflicted ones. It's an invitation to incomparable joy. An invitation to a lot of miraculous, redemptive excitement. Who would dare pass up that invitation? Not us. Not us. Amen.